Welcome to Sprinkle with Hope podcast with your host, Jason. And we have an awesome guest with us today. Jennifer Finlayson Fife is with us. And we are so excited to be talking to her today. Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife is an LDS relationship and sexuality coach, as well as a licensed clinical professional counselor in the state of Illinois. She has a PhD in counseling psychology. Her teaching and coach, coaching focus on helping LDS individuals and couples achieve greater satisfaction and passion in their emotional and sexual relationships. So Jennifer, if I can just start out, I got a question and you know, the question is, is there a difference between sex and intimacy? Definitely. Uh (laughs) So, I mean, obviously a lot of people use intimacy euphemistically for sex, but a lot of sex isn't very intimate. And so what I think of as intimacy is this, knowing and being known. And this can be on an emotional level, a spiritual level, a sexual level. I mean, these are a little bit false categories because I think the more we develop, the more we know that these are all kind of interconnected. But, um, but this is about being knowable. And mm. a lot of people say they want intimate, intimate relationships, but in fact, they don't because they don't want to be knowable. They want to be seen the way they want to be seen, the way they want to see themselves, but they don't necessarily want to be known, you know, especially the parts of themselves that they feel insecure about Mm -hmm. or underdeveloped or that they are not good parts of themselves. So being, you know, intimacy is a tall order that we both want and resist. And so we're kind of in a um, contradictory position within ourselves sometimes because we don't we want to not be alone and lonely or unknown but we also are afraid of the validation we may not be able to get yeah that's very interesting i've never thought about it that way that it could be simply completely avoiding touching any each other but more just getting to know each other on that level yeah so what are some ways that we can we can develop that you know i how, how do we do that? How do we develop our capacity for intimacy? Yes. Yeah, it's very much linked to tolerating. You must sacrifice ego to be knowable, really. And that is that you are going to prioritize what is true, what is true about you, what is true about others over what you want to have be true or how you want to be seen. And that's a developmental process that is to say we all start with a dependency on others to manage our sense of self because when you're a small child you don't have any other option than to look to your parents and caregivers and siblings to give you an idea about who you are and whether or not you matter and so on and even if you grow up in the most ideal of circumstances where you're loved and valued you're, there still is a process of tolerating your humanity, your fallibility, and growing into somebody that can, that lives with enough integrity that you tolerate being known for who you are. And you tolerate, or or you get more able to accept yourself as human and fallible and still worthy. I mean, that's a spiritual Mm -hmm. process to Mm -hmm. develop that, but it's definitely something we can develop in ourselves It takes some courage. It takes some willingness to value what's true over what you want to have true. Uh, But I think that's a measure of faith, really, in the truest sense of the word of faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. I, uh, as you were kind of talking about it, I, I I wondered too if, you know, there's there's oftentimes there's things that have happened in the past, whether that's, um, you you know. trauma of some kind yeah trauma of some kind and and stuff like Mm -hmm. that that i think that also too right can affect that intimacy because that's um, right for two for at least two reasons one is that anyone who's who's endured trauma has you know sexual trauma has learned that people who are close to you or who profess to love you or who have earned your trust could exploit you And that in and of itself is so disorganizing about who human beings really are and whether or not you should let yourself be open to or knowable to or entrust, you know, someone with knowing you. 
So there's that. And then there's also when it's specifically sexual because sexuality is so linked to our sense of self, so intimate. There is often this kind of self-protective instinct of the psyche is, you know, shut down sexuality, then you will be Mm -hmm. safe. And that's a very typical and certainly understandable response to try to protect yourself from exploitation. And so I think for people who are coming out of traumatic relationships or traumatic sexuality, it's, it's a process of reclaiming sexuality as something for yourself. That's something that's about you being at peace with yourself, your embodiment, your God-given sexuality, and then being more astute about whether or not your partnership is a good place to show up, (laughs) whether or not you can handle yourself and your own safety. A lot of times we try to make other people responsible for our safety rather than our own ability to make good decisions as, you know, where the locus of control is. And I'm not, I mean, I guess I'm saying like that it makes sense that somebody would learn to do it in this way. We all do it in this way, even if we don't come out of drama but learning how to take deeper kind of ownership of your life is what empowers people to be able to re-engage their sexuality. It's really becoming more clear to me that intimacy starts with myself and my ability to um, know who I am and trust that. And then, then I can reach out. Absolutely. It's just critical. So for, for parents out there who might be listening, are there, have you found that there are ways that we can teach our children this? <laughs> yeah. The, these yeah, of for things? sure. I mean, I think that, I, you know, I do a whole course on how to talk to your kids <laughs> about sexuality. So I, I definitely am helping parents both understand what their goal is mm-hmm. and then what that translates into at every developmental stage. Mm-hmm. But the goal that, as I see it, is is, well, let me say what I think sometimes people make the goal, but it ends up working against their kids is, is because especially faith-based people, we can have a high standard around sexual behavior. And we are trying to promote that high standard in a context of a post-sexual revolution, sexually liberal society, right? And so what a lot of people do, parents do, I think, well-intentioned as it may be, is kind of scare their kids <laughs> around yeah. sexuality yeah. and create a lot of fear around it. And I think some sort of false messages that are very unhelpful is kind of the idea that sex is more powerful than you are. Porn mm. is more powerful yeah. than you are. So just stay as far away from it as you can because if it gets you, it will suck you down to hell. Mm. And the reason why that's really unhelpful is, is that first of all, it puts the locus of control outside of the child or the mm-hmm. person, which is not helpful mm-hmm. because sexuality, like any passion, is one you have to integrate to be at peace. You can't just say, I want nothing to do with it. Um, and so when you create a fear relationship with it, you drive your children in their adulthood either into repression, like I want nothing to do with it, or some vacillating between repression and indulgence because you've infected a child's ability to integrate their sexuality. And by integrating it, what I mean by that is I want, I want to help people. Well, my, I, what I think of as the ideal thing is that you learn how to accept your God-given sexuality, that it's good. Like the body is good. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes like the body's good except for the bad parts. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> <That's> yeah. What, <laughs> we do. Okay. The body is good. And we need embodiment for our spiritual progression, inclusive of our sexuality and sensuality and pleasure. If we are that we might have joy, that's fundamental to pleasure. If you can't have pleasure, you can't have joy. Absolutely. Okay, so, so sexual joy is a, an essential part of life and an essential part of marriage and an essential part of our spirituality. This is not often how some of us think of it. How, that said, you know, you can be indulgent and destructive with it. You can do things that work against you or work against others. I think the best way you help people to not, to, to, to create a relationship to sexuality that creates joy is that you don't shame it. It, it just yeah. is. And God gave it to you. Okay. So it's valuable and it's good. That said, it's a powerful way of being in a relationship to yourself and others. And so how you're in that relationship matters always being respectful to oneself and respectful to others. 
thinking about, you know, <clears throat> this sexuality, these feelings I have are good. A lot of 12 year olds think their sexual feelings are bad. No, they're good. It's good. I mean, something, it would be bad if you weren't having any sexual feelings because right. something might be amiss. The fact that you have sexual feelings is good. The, the, the challenge is you're going to be kind of integrating this in order to become an adult while trying to make decisions that don't work against you or anyone else. So if you can give your kids a focus and a direction, I want to be capable of intimate partnership down the road. I want to have a, someone that I can love through my sexuality and be loved by, you know, to both give and receive love. Well, then I can think about, are, is this choice getting me closer or farther to that mm. goal? Because then it's not so shame-based. You're like, well, of course, pornography is appealing. You know, that's part of our wiring. But sitting around looking at it all day is not going to help me get better or more able to be at peace with and love through my sexuality. So it's not so shame-based, it's goal-directed. And, you know, everybody knows what it is to overeat sometimes. If you sit around and tell yourself you're a horrible person because you ate too much cake, you're, you're going to be less able to make good choices the next go around. So it's more like, yeah, of course, cake tastes good. It's a good part of life. Right. <laughs> but, you know, but if I want to have a good life, I mean, I need to, I want to navigate that in a way that food, I'm in a peaceful relationship to food and it blesses my life. What's that look like? So you're navigating this moderation because joy is in the moderation. And I don't mean boring by moderation. Right. I mean, it's wise. It's not too far one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I love that advice. And I guess I'd kind of caveat off, off of that. And is, is there any advice maybe that would be good for say newlyweds in the middle mm -hmm. and maybe mm -hmm. towards the end of, of this thing, well, would they be different or would they then be the same as far as intimacy is concerned? Well, so one thing I would say is some of the guidelines we give to young adult, I meaning like adolescents is and should be different than advice to adults. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, and a lot of times people kind of mix it all together. I mean, sure. it's, fine to have, <laughs> it's fine to have behavioral standards when you're younger, because just having these very concrete behavioral dictates can be helpful for a young mind. Okay. Sure. As you get older, you need more the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law in navigating what creates goodness in my life, in this marriage, in this reality. Right. So that takes a little more wisdom and good judgment to determine what that is. For newlyweds, you know, one thing I would say about that is that, first of all, I think one of the ideas that I see in a lot of the couples work I do is that people have learned, well, sex is kind of scary, okay, but sex is sort of in the domain of men. Now, I don't mean that men have a peaceful relationship with sexuality. They don't. And, and they really are often not in any better mm. shape than the women are. The women just are more overt about their troubles with sex in some ways. Uh, right. I, I'll say what I mean by that, because that's not quite fair. Because, But I think that, <laughs> you know, women tend to express it more in repression. That's what I would yeah. say, where men are more like overtly high desire, right? But, sure. but both are in conflicted relationships. The problem is that a lot of times people have grown up believing that, well, sex is really a male thing and a good woman is going to service that man in the marriage and that will keep him from looking at porn or going astray. And so it gets into this kind of servicing frame, which is deeply dissatisfying for both people. Right. It creates resentment very quickly on both sides. Desire plummets. If there was a desire difference in the beginning, it goes even to a more extreme desire difference because nobody wants to service somebody sexually for life. I mean, you, you don't want to even do it for the honeymoon. So. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's so. What I would say to newlyweds is think of this as a process of learning about each other's sexuality. Men's and women's sexuality is different, and both awesome and both wonderful in their own ways. And so how do you know each other and how do you create something shared? It's very, very important that this is shared. How do we create an experience that's satisfying for both? And if it takes us some time, then it takes us some time to figure that out. Sexuality is also much more than intercourse because a lot of times right. it gets very intercourse centric. Honeymoon, the woman is traumatized and in pain and she's like, I don't want to do that again. And he's like, score, this is for eternity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you have a problem that's already started before you've even left the, the uh, resort. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so you, I would say, especially if a couple's been very conservative in their behavior premaritally to take their time, you know, there's intercourse is great. Okay. But the woman really needs to be highly aroused for that to not hurt too much. And, and so, and there's a lot you can do that is very important for women's sexuality that, that pre-intercourse arousal is extremely important. So taking your time and learning about arousal, learning how you can have two people aroused, that's all extremely important for a good marital sexual foundation. But first and foremost most is this idea that we are equals, that you know, we may be different. We may value different things at times, mm -hmm. of course, and that's good. But we, mat we both matter in this relationship and figuring that out for two is a worthwhile endeavor. That really sets you up for success. Mm -hmm. yeah, but really, really love your advice. I, it's really hitting home to me of things that I, I'm learning that I can do to help. So yeah. let's say, let's say we have a partnership and one of them doesn't quite understand this, <laughs> the intimacy of the relationship. Mm -hmm. How can the other partner help guide that person through? What are some tips and Take my courses. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. For sure. I, sign up for Jennifer's courses. I, yeah. Great advice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm tongue in cheek a little, but it is so much what I'm teaching. Like you can't do this if this is in a servicing frame. It will not work right. out. So, so let's, you know, like I do the art of desire, which is a women's course and women's retreats. And a lot of times they're like, oh my gosh, how's my husband going to learn all about my sexuality? And he needs to understand this. And, um, and also just the idea of equality. Well, the thing is, it, it means just coming and starting to talk about it. This is what I think we've been creating. I don't think this has gone well for us. It's I've not been happy, but neither have you. And we came by it honestly. This is how we were taught to do it. But I'm starting to see this differently. And I'm starting to see that this is something that, you know, if you're the husband in that and you have a low desire wife to say, like, I'm starting to see why it makes sense, why you wouldn't want the sex we've been having. You're not crazy. You're not broken. You have good judgment. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And maybe I feel bad that we've been in the dark for so long because it's it's been hard on both of us. But I think there's a new way we can start to think about this. Sometimes. Uh, I'll just stay in that frame for a minute. The wife might be like, thank goodness. Who have you been talking to? I'm so glad <laughs> <laughs> you're starting to get some of this. Some wives might be like, no, I'm fine with it the way it is. That is, I would rather service you and not really show up mm -hmm. than have to develop myself more because it's a way of hiding. Mm -hmm. And I, there's a reciprocal version of this for men. And I can say that one in a second, but like, I prefer the idea that I'm the long suffering one putting up with you and your hedonism, because then I don't have to kind of reconcile myself with my sexuality, with my sense of self. I might resent you for not treating me like an equal, but do I really want to act like an equal, like to actually be responsible for loving you, not just being loved by you? Do you see what I mean? Like a, mm -hmm. yeah. a lot of people want to kind of hide in that dependent role while resenting it. Yeah. And again, that's human behavior. It's just, if you're in my office, you get called out on it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah. totally. Also like yeah. that you, that you talked about your course. So how can our listeners find your courses? So just on my website, finlayson fifecom there's just, you know, there's the podcast, which is free content. Then there's the courses and I teach five courses. There's how to talk to your kids about sex. And it's primarily for L meaning because I, I'm LDS and I right. wrote my dissertation on LDS women and sexuality. That is my primary focus, but this is really for any faith-based person. You don't even have to be awesome. faith-based. They're just true principles. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. So it, right. It, they're valuable <laughs> principles for anyone. But, um, but uh, so I do a couple's relationship course, which is really around how to create more intimacy in your relationship emotionally, how to live more honestly, how to deal with your negative when you're upset, the negative things and the self-protective things that you do that undermine intimacy and undermine a kind of openness, that's the relationship course. And then I have a couple's sexuality course that's just a follows from that around how to understand what you're creating through your sexual dynamic that is oftentimes exacerbating this high and low desire dynamic. 
because there's something unhealthy. So it makes people take sort of extreme positions actually. So the more people can see their own participation in that negative dynamic, the more they can be really open participating partners and creating something much more meaningful for both people. And then I have a men's sexuality course and a women's sexuality course that's really about the same becoming capable of intimacy. It's a self-developmental course for both okay. and a sexual developmental course. So it's both pieces are fundamental to those individual courses. So you brought up uh, low desire, high desire, and then you, you know, I, I, I guess I want to tie that back to something you also said, which was that there was kind of this stigma that the men is always the yeah. high desire, but do you really find that to be true or is it more equal? I would say about a third of my clients, the woman is the higher desire, but um, I think that's also a, a somewhat of an artifact of our cultural messaging. So that is to say, right. I think that men often do show up as the higher desire person because part of the way that women learn about how to be feminine and how to be the ideal woman is to be virtuous, i.e. not sexual. Mm. So it's a way that women often are trying to retain their value is to shed their sexuality. And so I think maybe relative to a non-religious population, it's more distorted in the frame that men are higher desire because they have more cultural room to be masculine and sexual, right? So that said, I think men in a lot of faith cultures still get a lot of messaging that, well, okay, you may be sexual because you're a guy, but you should be deeply ambivalent about this because it's something you do to a woman. It potentially is destructive Right. So especially if you think, well, OK, it'll be OK as long as she wants it. But if she doesn't want it because she has her own anxieties about it, well, then what do you do? And so you're waiting for her to make it OK, but she's not really in a position to make it OK because she has her own anxieties about sex. And so the man is maybe higher desire. That is, I want sex. I want you to want it. I want you to want me. But it doesn't mean that they're really necessarily at peace with their sexuality. Mm. And, you know, as I taught, taught the men's sexuality course, you know, multiple times and, and really hearing more of men's stories, you just can see how some men are pretty tortured about their sexuality. And then they can't sort of get the validation at home and with the woman they love. And so then it's easy to take their resentments and their, and their fear and the sense of rejection and go channel that sexuality towards something like pornography Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we really, really, really vilify men around pornography. And I'm not trying to say, you know, it's a good thing, but it, it certainly makes sense in a context of feeling rejected sexually that you're right. sort of looking for some way. A lot of times what some of my clients are looking at is images of women who desire sex. You know, it's sort of this feeling of like, is that even a possibility? Is there such a thing as a woman who wants this? So Again, it's, it, we don't do a good job of helping men and women, boys and girls in the church to see sexuality as good. Well, good because it's of the body and of God. Mm -hmm. But then what you do and what you create, that you can create deeply meaningful uh, connection through sexuality. It's a place to love and be loved. It's a way to, mm -hmm. for men to bless women's lives, to offer them joy and pleasure. Um, there's so much beauty that we can have through sexuality, but because we don't teach it enough, most of us are just like kind of waiting mm -hmm. for our marriage or our marriage partner to make something legit that they just can't sort of feel okay about on its own terms. And that yeah. just doesn't work out. Yeah. And I think a lot of that goes back to us, our generation, not, not wanting to talk about this stuff because it was sort of taboo and yeah, we don't talk about those things. So I, I appreciate yeah. your willingness to come and talk about these things and really open my eyes to <laughs> Yeah. W ways that I can help. Well, there's so many good people that really just don't know how to make it better. They, they know it's not working. They're afraid to go look for resources because very quickly you can right. get unhelpful stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And, and, and it's, it's not for a lack of, it's just like not knowing or having a vision of how they may be participating in the problem because they've been so steeped in that way of thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. I, I think that definitely, you know, cause that could be a rabbit hole. Yeah. Uh, right. That leads them totally in a different direction, but yeah. I could see how, you know, men or, or, and, or women, right. Are, yeah. are looking for 
answers as to what Absolutely. what do I do in this situation where I want to have that intimacy with my yeah. spouse, but yeah. they don't want it as much as I do. Yes. So how exactly. do I get them to match my right. level? Right. Or low desire women have often been the ones that come to me because they 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 feel bad about it, but they don't know how to get out mm. of the and, and in some ways it's very helpful for them to see like, oh, it's been good judgment that I haven't wanted that kind of sex, but there's another possibility. There's something that could be much better for both of us. And so that's when lots of things start shifting for people and a whole new world starts to open up to them. Mm, that's awesome. Mm. This has been a fantastic conversation. I've really, really enjoyed it. So Shane and I, you know, towards the end of our podcast recordings, we always do what's called the double down dose. And so I definitely want to get your, your take on this. Um, so I ask I'm a scared. question and then Shane asks a question. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so my question is, and maybe I'll, I'll frame it a little bit differently because normally we just ask, what is your definition of hope? But maybe mm. what is your definition of hope and then hope in intimacy? Maybe mm. I'll add that just a little extra mm-hmm. piece on it. So what's hope? And then what's hope in into intimacy and marriage, you know, relationship? Good. Okay. So, so um, let me say what I think of hope is. I mean, hope is the idea that there's, that there's something better than what is current and that there's something you can do to affect what is present, right? That you can do something that you have some power to make a world, the world better, to make your reality better. And I think when people don't have that sense of efficacy or a sense that they can do something, it's depression is right there. You know, it's the, that sense of loss or sense of powerlessness is brutal. And I think, you know, I, given the work I do see a lot of dark, I see a lot of dark, both that has happened to people that people are often promoting and creating in their lives and it can be sobering sometimes, um, mm-hmm. but I think the hope for me is that there is so much beauty in the world. There really is. Like sometimes after a hard session, I'll just listen to Chopin or I'll listen to, you know, Bach because there's they are communicating beauty that is real. And and I my other thing I would say is that truth is fundamentally hopeful. It's sometimes so hard to see what's true because you see your participation in your own suffering. You see that you've created suffering for someone else. It's so harrowing at times to face what's true, but it's also what is tethered to hope because when you can see what's true, you now have better choices that you can make. You can, you can align the relationship or the body, meaning around marriage and relationship, what happens is when you have distortion in what's true, you create an amorphous body in the marriage. So when you come in for some help or you take a course and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm a part of this dysmorphic body. (laughs) And so it hurts you like the surgery is like, okay, we're gonna have to break this arm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And and this is without anesthetic. Okay. And (laughs) And it really hurts. And, but if you go through that process, will you get bandaged up? And now you have a chance, you're maybe in some pain still, but you have a chance for that body to grow, you know, in a, in a right way. And then you have more strength, you have more peace, you have more capacity in that body. And so that's hope. I mean, truth hurts, but it's also the foundation of hope. And so, you know, a lot of my job sometimes is trying to tell people the truth as honestly as I see it, even mm-hmm. though it's hard sometimes to tell people what they don't know, because you know, you're taking a whack at their femur. You know? right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it hurt. But that's the reason why I'm willing to do it is because that's when I've seen people really change and shift things and start to live more joyfully. They become more trustworthy. Their partners loves them and is more open to them you know, that is the way that people get better. And and that's what makes me believe in God and believe in goodness is when you see people make those courageous changes and you see more light come into their lives. I have awesome. very much enjoyed this discussion, Jennifer. This has been very eye, eye-opening to me. So uh, I really appreciate it. So the second Thank part you. of Double Down Dose, um, Jason and I, talk about hope a lot we've come up in it with an acronym 
for mm-hmm. hope, H O P E, mm-hmm. heart overcome passion and enough. Mm-hmm. What? How would you define passion? Mm. Well, p- passion is this kind of zest for. Uh, again, these are top of mind, so I, I may yeah. be like, no, I missed that whole thing. I should have said. <laughs> but anyway, but I think it's this zest for living. This like you know, you, you care about something. So there's a lot of heart in it. I want something, something matters. Like I have a passion for helping people. I, I don't tell anybody, but I would do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> we won't say anything. <laughs> nope. Closed. <laughs> I love <Exactly>. it. <laughs> because it's gratif- It's so meaningful for me. So I have a passion for it. So I think about it even when I'm not working, you know, I just, my mind is, so it's like it. It's passion is linked to desire, um, zest, like or, or or energy, and also depth. Like you, you want to know something deeply. Passion for a spouse is that you know it's high valuing of them. You feel gratitude that you're in your their life. You're grateful they're there. The way you touch them has an element of of acknowledgement and gratitude and um, desire. Not out of I want to con- like have you to reinforce me but i value your presence in my life and so it also has a depth to it it's not just i want you for how you reinforce me i want to know you who you are i value you as a separate person from me i don't value you just because you make me feel safe or good i value you because you are a human being that i respect that i have um, a responsibility to, in a sense, not in a caretaking way, but just because I sure. promised God I'd love you. And so I want to know who you are, even the parts that are inconvenient. Mm-hmm. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Hit the nail on the head. I love this. This has <laughs> been so fascinating. I, I truly, you know, I've listened to a lot of your stuff. Um, and I'm so happy that we finally got the chance to connect and, and, and talk and, and bring hope into to marriage and intimacy. And I really hope that the listeners listening to this can get that hope. And, you know, if it's take one of Jennifer's courses, great, take the course, you know, get that intimacy better in your marriage. I think we can all yeah, get better at that. Right. I mean, there's yeah. no, nobody left out of this. Yeah. We, I'll say this just one last thing is that I think sometimes we want to make sexuality and intimacy, this sort of sidebar thing, or like the frosting on the cake, but not that important. I think it's really foundational Mm -hmm. because when it's not working in marriages, the marriage, the marriage foundation is really uh, weak. And so I don't mean to say you just need to like stomach through something that's terrible, but (laughs) you need to kind of figure out why is it not working? What is it showing us about who we are? It's a canary in the coal mine. And so it's an important way of thinking about who are we, how can we grow? It's exposing a place of growth, a potential place of growth for you. Yeah, Jennifer, thank you so much for your time today and your insight. It has been fascinating to pick your brain. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's been fun.